Marvellous. So good evening, everybody. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you uh, to the MLR's Chorley Lecture on our 80th anniversary, quite remarkably. Um, and I was just thinking to myself and remarking that I, I love the Chorley Lecture because it's just a big reunion. Uh, because you have people that you see on a regular basis, and then you have, then you have Chorley people that you see at the Chorley Lecture, and that's when you're definitely going to be able to bank your time with them. Um, so, and I can see that um, a lot of people are going, have lots of faces going, oh, hello, you know, how many decades? So, as I say, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you. Um, before I um, introduce our speaker, though, I'm afraid I am going to uh, ask you for a, a moment's silence uh, for another colleague on the MLR who sadly died uh, since our last Chorley Lecture. Um, I'm afraid this is the third time that I've actually have to had to introduce a Chorley Lecture with a moment's silence for uh, one of our colleagues, both from the Law Department and from the Editorial Committee. Uh, and sadly, Helen Rees, uh, who is a pro uh, Associate Professor here at uh, the Law Department, uh, specialist in, very well known for her work in family law, uh, died of cancer uh, in November uh, last year. So if we could just have a moment's silence, please, in memory of Helen and the fantastic person that she was, as well as the work that she did. Thank you. So now to um, the introduction of our speaker. And I'm delighted, absolutely delighted, uh, to welcome James Crawford to give our Chorley Lecture tonight. Um, obviously needs no introduction, but uh, form says that I should introduce. Um, so James is uh, obviously a judge of the International Court of Justice, and previously he was Wayward Professor of International Law at Cambridge from 92 to 2015, and has also had, held chairs in Australia and China. As a member of the UN International Law Commission, he was responsible for the draft statute for an international criminal court in 1994 and the RC Articles on State Responsibility in 2001. In addition to his scholarly work, uh, he's been involved as a counsel, expert or arbitrator in over 100 international law cases. In 2012, he was awarded the Hudson Medal by the American Society of International Law and in 2013 was appointed Companion of the Order of Australia. Uh, so James is going to give us a lecture entitled The Current Political Discourse Concerning International Law. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And it's very nice to see so many friends in the audience. Reading current statements of world leaders on subjects relevant to international law is liable to cause confusion, even distress, to those for whom the 1945 regulatory arrangements, as completed in the post-Cold War era, have become the norm. On some occasions, international law is invoked, but in what seems an increasingly antagonistic way, amounting often to a dialogue of the deaf. At other times, it is apparently or even transparently ignored. This touches many of the arrangements governments spent the preceding period seeking to establish, whether concerning in no particular order human rights, international and regional, international humanitarian law, refugee protection, free trade, climate change, the regulation of ocean spaces, international dispute settlement, foreign investment, international criminal law, the rules relating to the use of force, nuclear non-proliferation, and so on. Is there a pattern to all this, and how should we respond? Obviously, a complete answer would require one to look in detail at each of those areas, and none of us have the time for that tonight. Um, there is the problem also of foot, what I call foreground noise, presently a cacophony, associated with such developments as Brexit, the policies and pronouncements of the new United States administration, controversies over Syria, Iran, North Korea, Ukraine, and more generally, the apparent backlash against globalization in its various forms. I can't do this tonight. All I can do is, all I can hope to do is to point to certain features of our present situation to try to put them into some legal perspective. 
Its task is not made any easier by the fact that as a judge of the International Court, there are severe limits on what I can say, especially concerning current controversies. Being an international judge is a bit like being in perpetual purdah, not limited to election campaigns. So I'll be predominantly descriptive, and nothing I say implies any opinion of any kind on current controversies. <laughs> Still less any opinion on matters that may come before the court. So I'm completely neutered. The international system is a sort of layer cake. At least it is a sedimentary formation has a core of institutions and rules which might be described as comprising the necessary law of nations, to use Vattel's term. No doubt international law is not necessary in the sense of historically inevitable. Still less do we think of it as Vattel did or claimed to do as a reflection of some imminent law of nature. But it is implicit the way, in the way that we have organized the world over time. Its necessary in core, core includes the modalities of interstate relations, the principle of the formal equality of states, the general capacity of governments to represent the state and its people, the processes of treaty making, and so on. It's, an, it's interesting to see the reflection of this common core in the joint declaration on the promotion of international law issued by the Russian Federation and China on 25 June 2016. They said, and I quote, the principles of international law are the cornerstone for just and equitable international relations. States enjoy their rights on the basis of independence and on an equal footing, and assume their obligations and responsibilities on the basis of mutual respect. States have the right to participate in the making of, interpreting and applying international law on an equal footing, and have the obligation to comply with international law in good faith and in a coherent and consistent manner." End of quote. I stress this was China and Russia. They went on to identify the common core of key rules of international law, which should be the subject of this treatment, as including the principle of non-intervention in the internal or external affairs of the state, and the principle of peaceful settlement of disputes, though subject to a certain qualification. A hypothetical, and I stress hypothetical, cynic might ob observe that perhaps the most important accusations currently made against the authors of the joint declaration are respectively the hacking of, by one of them, of the United States presidential election, and the outright rejection by the other of a decision of a tribunal constituted under the law of the Sea Convention concerning the South China Sea. Perhaps such declarations cannot always be taken at face value. But it is, I suppose, something that they are made. One may compare this joint statement with the putative formulation of the international relations theory of the new United States administration. It was authored by the National Security Advisor and the Director of the National Economic Council, and published in the Wall Street Journal. After dealing with such matters as the importance of reciprocity in trade and commerce, the United States commitment to NATO, the fight against terrorism, and the need for a historic peace deal between Israelis and Palestinians. It concludes by endorsing, somewhat in contrast to those useful sentiments, and they quote, a clear-eyed outlook that the world is not a global community, but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businesses engage and compete for advantage. Rather than deny this elemental nature of international affairs, we embrace it. End of quotation. Evidently, there can be different visions of this elemental arena. Competition, whether for pockets or for hearts and minds, can occur within an area governed in principle by law, a level playing field. Elsewhere in their piece, McMaster and Cohen used the phrase in its application to the terms of fair trade that they called for. And we know that a level playing field entails minimum protection against coercion more generally at least some elements of the rule of law, including respect for concluded agreements. Otherwise, there is no such thing as peace treaties, only truces. But in the framework of international relations, the clear-eyed denial of a global community also conjures up Matthew Arnold's bleak vision in Dover Beach of a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night. 
And in response to McMaster and Cohen, the New York Times characterised their competitive arena more in the manner of Dover Beach. A vision of a, this is a quotation, a vision of a world of cutthroat competition and zero-sum outcomes, deeply at odds with the more cooperative, rule-based vision that has motivated, motivated America and its allies since World War II. What McMaster and Cohen may seem to ignore is the possibility that whether or not there is a global community, a matter which depends rather on one's definition of community, there are incontestably global, communal or collective interests. Among these, I would list a minimum of environmental stewardship and the prevention, so far as possible, of wars of destruction and weapons of mass destruction. The reality is that many of these collective interests cannot be secured except by consistent common action, which in turn applies respect for agreements freely negotiated. The image of the world of cutthroat competition and zero-sum outcomes is the old one of national sovereignty as freedom from all restraint, whereas we, have, we had thought to have arrived at an undertaking of sovereignty which is capable of being shared for particular purposes, if not pooled, and which is not inherently biased towards unilateral action. I do not cooperate, therefore I am sovereign. That's not a logically compelling argument. If sovereign aims require commitment, sovereignty must allow for commitment. Marty Koskinami has warned against the illusion, and I quote, that the 1990s constituted an ex exceptional moment of liberal opportunity portrayed by the war on Iraq and everything that ensued. End of quotation. The more cooperative rules-based vision to which the New York Times editorial referred might seem to be based on that illusion. But the fact is that there was a plan that those present at the creation of the post-1945 world order uh, shared to a degree. It was supplemented by subsequent common action. It was interrupted but not destroyed by Cold War rivalry. And it constituted a sort of genetic program for the order which was largely completed following the gradual end of the Cold War. I referred to aspects of that program in my introduction, and I need to enumerate its basic elements only briefly. They included restrictions on the use of force except in individual or collective self-defense or with the authorization of the Security Council. The attempted qualification of responsibility to protect has not or not yet escaped Security Council disciplines and subsequent unilateral exercises of force, however brief and targeted, have been tolerated rather than embraced. Human rights at regional level and then globally, international humanitarian law and with the conventions of 1949 and 1977 and subsequent specific treaties, regime of refugee protection, against the background of a still valid general rule that the state is entitled to control access to its territory. So those two rules operate together. Cooperative action against terrorism, including now an approach to a general definition of terrorism, which has taken us 30 years. The world regime of free trade, arduously negotiated in the WTO cover, covered agreements, including a dispute settlement mechanism integrated into the agreements. A diffuse system of environmental protection, the regulation of ocean spaces in a comprehensive agreement subject to dispute settlement, development of international criminal law, first through ad hoc tribunals, then the International Criminal Court in force in 2002, a regime of nuclear non-proliferation which at least limited the number of declared and undeclared nuclear weapon states while allowing access to nuclear energy technology. Whatever the defects and gaps, I do not think that this program is illusory or trivial. Of course, it has been partially and imperfectly implemented. And we can all point to our favorite illustrations of silly moves at the transnational level where these values seem to have been taken to excess. Take, for example, just the field of human rights. The British government has targeted for criticism a series of decisions of the Strasbourg Court on prisoners' voting rights. The British government holds the view that Hearst and subsequent cases improperly encroach on Parliament's authority. But it's important to note that the European Court is not demanding that the disenfranchising legislation be repealed and has reaffirmed the wide margin of appreciation accorded to states. 
The crux of these decisions has been the blanket disenfranchisement of all persons in prison, regardless of their circumstances. With perhaps greater justification, the United Kingdom has attacked the finding by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention that Julian Assange's confinement at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London involved an unlawful act by the United Kingdom and Sweden. On this basis, a person seeking and receiving diplomatic asylum in order to escape a European arrest warrant may be thought to have been jointly held in custody by both the receiving and the requesting states. Even worse, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has committed itself to the untenable proposition that, and I quote, the opinions of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention are legally binding to the extent that they are based on binding international human rights law, thereby ignoring the obvious point that a non-judicial body, even if it's competent to opine, cannot elevate its recommendations to the level of binding decisions by reference to a treaty which it cannot with binding and force interpret. Then there is the Strasbourg decisions that refugees turned back on the high seas have been collectively expelled from the territory of the state concerned, contrary to the non-derogable requirements of Article 4 of Protocol 4 to the Convention. Such self-erecting examples help account for international norm fatigue not to mention backlash. Sometimes backlash indeed can be an appropriate response. I referred earlier to Vattel's necessary law of nations, but so far at least, so far at least the impact of current political discourse has been felt more in respect of Vattel's second category, the voluntary law of nations. The post-1945 framework, in detail if not in principle, is the work of negotiation of treaties, mostly multilateral treaties. Many of these contain express provisions for withdrawal, and some of those which do not, the United Nations Charter, for example, are understood to be subject to withdrawal on notice. With respect to such treaties, it is a question of policy rather than law, whether or not to withdraw, whatever the implications from an international public policy point of view may be. But international law affects the modalities and consequences of withdrawal, especially when it comes to vested rights of the parties or to pending proceedings national constitutional law may also be relevant. Still, it's helpful to re re review the withdrawal cases, because we're, we seem to be in a period of, withdraw of withdrawal, whether or not they encapsulate legal disputes. The focus of current political discourse on international law very much focuses on these cases. And they form a broad spectrum. At one end of the spe spectrum is the abandonment of treaties not yet concluded. It's generally believed the United States has abandoned the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, though the position is actually less than clear. Uh, then there are examples of unsigning treaties requiring ratification but not yet ratified. Both the United States and more recently the Russian Federation unsigned the Rome Statute for International Criminal Court. Again, such a notification of unsignature, a new word, is not unlawful and is expressly envisaged in Article 19 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Slightly further along the spectrum are cases of withdrawal of provisional application of treaties. The problem here is caused by the rather libertarian international rules on conclusion of treaties, including provisions for provisional application before treaties come definitively into effect. This creates a freedom of executive action which extends to apparently irreversible commitments during the period of provisional application. Thus, in the UCOS case, an investment tribunal upheld the legal effect of provisional application, notwithstanding Russia's later withdrawal from the Energy Charter Treaty. The effect was to create an extended, decades-long commitment to arbitration despite the absence of ratification. The Hague District Court has set aside those awards and an appeal is pending. The field of investment arbitration is also a much discussed arena for withdrawal from treaties which have been duly and definitively concluded, another site of backlash. Rather unfairly singled out here is the ICSID Convention of 1965, International Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes, 
unfairly in that it is a mere delivery vehicle, not itself either a ground of consent to arbitration or a source of substantive standards to be applied. There are currently 153 parties to the ICSID Convention. Three states, Bolivia, Ecuador and Venezuela, have denounced it. So far, only three. A related, more salient point can be made about unilateral withdrawal from bilateral investment treaties, BITs, which are both the source of standards and of consent to arbitration. As of May 2016, seven states had unilaterally withdrawn from their BITs. Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, South Africa, Indonesia, Italy and Russia. Now we can add India to the list. Most of these BITs remain in force due to sunset provisions and the sunset can be a very long one, whether or not the state is in the tropics. In addition, the EU is in the process of attempting to consolidate its member state investment obligations, as a result of which um, it, it, it's inevitable in the shorter or longer term that intra-EU treaties will disappear. Let me take three examples of withdrawal, each of them recent and well known. South Africa's withdrawal from the International Criminal Court, Britain's pending withdrawal from the EU, and the recent US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. Taking South Africa first. As is well known, the African Union has been campaigning against the International Criminal Court for some years on the grounds of alleged bias uh, and the appearance of bias due to the fact that the only active defendants in ICC cases are African individuals. A resolution of the AU's assembly in January to 2017, and I quote, welcomed and fully supported the sovereign decision taken by Burundi, South Africa and the Gambia as pioneer implementers of the withdrawal strategy regarding their notification of withdrawal from the ICC, the sovereign decision. It adopted the ICC withdrawal strategy and called on member states to consider implementing its recommendations. Of the three withdrawals that have occurred, two have been withdrawn. The Gambia did so after a general election and change of government. South Africa did so after a High Court ruling that the government was incompetent to withdraw from a treaty implemented by Parliament. So for the moment, only Burundi remains a lever in Democratic Alliance against Ministry of Internal, uh, International Relations, the claimant challenged the decision by the executive to withdraw South Africa from the Rome Statute without parliamentary approval, and that claim was upheld by the High Court on grounds of domestic separation of powers. This was the South African equivalent of the Miller case. The Court concluded that the separation of powers established by the Constitution for entering into a treaty should be respected in the case of withdrawal as well. While the executive had the power to determine the policy of withdrawal from the Rome Statute, this withdrawal can only take effect once approved by Parliament and after the repeal of the implementing legislation. Three points of general interest may be noted from the decision. First, the court highlighted the importance that the parliamentary process be properly carried out. It criticised urgency procedures stating that unexplained haste without explanation by the executive would constitute procedural irrationality, going well beyond what an English court would do in similar circumstances, I believe. The second point to note is the absence of any reference to the UK Supreme Court's decision in Miller, which had been decided one month earlier and which was cited to the court. The court treated the question as purely one of South African constitutional law, an indigenous, not an introduced doctrine. The third point of interest is what the court said about withdrawal processes under international law generally. The court noted that Article 127 of the Rome Statute states simply that a withdrawal will be effective if signed by a duly authorised representative. But both the Rome Statute and the Vienna Convention are characteristically silent as to how and by whom a withdrawal decision should be made. This is a question of domestic law, a domestic issue in which international law does not and cannot prescribe. As a matter of domestic constitutional law, the court conclu concluded that a, a notice of withdrawal 
on a proper construction of the relevant provision of the South African Constitution is the equivalent of ratification which requires prior parliamentary approval. In the event South Africa revoked its withdrawal by a note verbal to the Secretary General of 7 March 2017, whistly entitled, Withdrawal of Notification of Withdrawal. I assume the drafter resisted the temptation to call it notification of withdrawal of notification of withdrawal. <laughs> there are some indications that the government intends to press on with a further notification of withdrawal, however that may be entitled. A press release of 9 March 2017 confirmed that there would be no appeal to the Constitutional Court from the decision, but that the government's intention was to take the process of South Africa's withdrawal from the ICC forward. But the bill to repeal the implementation of the Rome Statute was withdrawn. And the indications are that it's now not a matter of political priority. Um, Maybe it's South Africa is waiting to see what will happen when the, ICC, when the ICC decides on an application by the prosecutor in relation to its breach of the Rome Statute in inviting the President of Sudan to visit South Africa. Given the recent invitation by Jordan for the President of Sudan to attend the Arab League summit, it may be that the heat has gone out of the ICC proceedings against South Africa. I turn somewhat hesitantly to Brexit. One starts with the Supreme Court's decision in the Miller case, where the court upheld the, the the claimant's position that the passing of legislation before the government could give its notice of withdrawal from the EU under Article 50 was necessary. The content and character of the applicable constitutional rules was not in dispute in Miller. No issue of international law was raised. The principal point of disagreement was how the European Communities Act, which was described as the conduit pipe for EU rights and duties, should be understood within the constitutional regime. As the 1972 Act gives priority to EU law, and in some cases does not require domestic implementing legislation when there are changes to the law, the court considers its effects to be unprecedented in constitutional terms. Those who come from countries with a written constitution have been used to thinking of the United Kingdom as somehow lacking. But Miller identified a constitutional situation. The domestic legal effects of withdrawal would include those of a constitutional kind, namely the, the loss of a source of law. The court explained that the prerogative treaty making power only exists harmoniously with the principle of parliamentary sovereignty because of the dualist theory of international law in the UK. When withdrawal from a treaty creates automatic domestic legal consequences, it oversteps the bounds of the crown prerogative. Lords Reed, Carnworth and Hughes dissented. Lord Reed, with whom Lord Hughes concurred, disagreed on the basis that the 1972 Act does not create statutory rights and obligations in the ordinary sense, but merely gives effect, merely gives effect to EU law as it stands at the relevant time. An intriguing dissent, um, but one which obviously did not appeal to the majority. Lord Carnworth, in a more con traditional mode, concluded there was no conflict between executive and legislative power on the basis that Article 50, the Article 50 notice merely triggers a political process that doesn't change obligations or rights until the repeal occurs. The relevant legislation was duly, briefly and rather summarily enacted and negotiations for Brexit are proceeding, if proceeding is not too strong a word. <laughs> Looked at from an international law point of view, three comments come to mind. The first concerns Scotland. As was suggested, and this is a quotation from Professor Armstrong in his recent book on Brexit, it was suggested during the independence referendum that if Scotland split from the rest of the UK, it was highly likely that the latter would be treated in international law as the successor state to the rights and obligations previously exercised by the UK as a whole. 
If Scotland gained independence prior to Brexit, it would be the rest of the UK that would be the successor state to EU membership and not Scotland. If succession occurred after Brexit, there would be no UK membership of the EU to which to succeed. An international lawyer would point out that if uh, whether or not Scotland is to separate, uh, the UK is not a successor to the rights and obligations arising from the EU and its terminating treaties. It is the same state under new auspices, one might say under new management. The second point concerns the basis and status of the negotiations. President Armstrong writes, it is perhaps the irony of Brexit that the EU is not a state with complete sovereignty and freedom to do what it wants, how it wants. It remains an international organization and the powers of its institutions are defined in and limited by its founding treaties. That legal context shapes the form of its legal relations with non-EU states including its approach to trade deals. Indeed, there is a, a, a great deal of tension within the EU legal order between the underlying framework, which is an international law framework of treaties subject to normal treaty processes, and the internal law of the EU, which is not international law in any orthodox sense. But when you're negotiating within the EU for a situation outside it, the hybrid character of the EU is very much at stake. I probably better stop there. The third question concerns dispute settlement, which has several aspects. One is the possibility of continuing jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in some form post-Brexit. Before the recent election, this was very much a red line of the government, so something that was excluded a priori. I don't know what the position is now. But there will have to be something because it is overwhelmingly likely that there will be a continued range of rights and obligations and possibly regimes between the EU and the UK for which dispute settlement will be called for. Whether it takes the form of arbitration or an analogue of the EFTA court or something else. And that's, uh, I think, uh, something which international lawyers are rather used to. Another aspect is dispute settlement over the terms of Brexit itself. And here there's an important distinction between the position within the two-year Article 50 negotiating period and subsequently. As Professor Armstrong points out, looking at the Vienna Convention on Treaties, Article 5 is clear that as regards treaties governing international organizations, provisions of the convention apply without prejudice to any rules of the agreement all of which directs us towards the EU treaties and to Article 50 in particular. While Article 50 is not constitutive of a right to withdraw, it does nonetheless lay down binding EU legal norms and procedures for the exercise of that right by a member state. That Brexit will be conducted through Article 50 TEU is to accept the continued political and legal authority of the EU until withdrawal has occurred. And so perhaps the paradox of Article 50 is that its invocation is also an act of fidelity at the moment of the divorce. Uh, I quote that, I don't, I don't think I should comment on it. My third example of withdrawal is provided inevitably by the United States withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a very strange animal. It doesn't have a title other than Paris Agreement. Normally treaties have a title, there is no title. Its relationship to the Framework Convention on climate change of 1992 is completely unspecified. Uh, it was drafted under circumstances of the failure of the predecessor agreement, uh, but a dominant concern by the negotiating states at the possibility of catastrophic climate change over time. The United States has not been clear as to whether it intends to comply with the withdrawal procedures set out in Article 28 of the Paris Agreement, or whether it intends to withdraw with immediate effect. Mrs Merkel has already, so it is said, delivered two law lectures to the President, which may explain the state of relations between them. I didn't say that. One of those lectures was on the Refugee Convention, 
One was on the incompetence of Germany or any other individual EU member state to conclude a separate trade agreement with the United States, a point which if the United States president had a legal advisor, he might no doubt have been advised was the case. There may be a need for a third lecture on the absence under international law of an unqualified and unconditional right of withdrawal from treaties. Article 42.2 and 54A of the Vienna Convention together suggest that withdrawal from a treaty will only be legally effective if the withdrawal takes, a place in conformity, takes place in conformity with the provisions of the treaty. And that requires compliance with Article 28 of the Paris Agreement. The New York Times reports that the United States, and I quote, will stick to withdrawal process laid out in the Paris Agreement. That could take nearly four years to complete meaning that a decision, a final decision, will be up to the American voters in the next presidential election. It's unclear where the New York Times obtained this information. But if this is the approach that will be taken, the US withdrawal would not be effective until 4 November 2020, one day after the next US presidential election. So timing is everything. It may well be possible to shortcut this four-year period by instead withdrawing from the United Nations Framework Convention of 1992. Under Article 28.3, an effective withdrawal from the Framework Convention would also operate as a withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and would take only one year to be effective. The United States has not done this, at least apparently not. One commentator suggests that it would have been more difficult since the Framework Convention was ratified by President Bush on the advice and consent of the Senate, which means that there is an argument that withdrawal from the Framework Convention might only be effective under US constitutional law with the Senate's consent, the Miller argument. The principal US Supreme Court decision in point, which concerns a bilateral treaty with Taiwan, the US analogue of the Miller and Democratic Alliance decisions is indecisive. This issue does not arise with respect to the Paris Agreement. The decision of President Obama not to seek Senate consent for the Paris Agreement was made because he knew that he couldn't get the majority needed. Following the Senate elections in November 2014, before the adoption of the Paris Agreement, the Senate voted that climate change was real. You'd be relieved to hear but it couldn't get the 60 votes needed to pass a second non-binding amendment that humans were the cause of climate change. It's not too much to say that the whole unusual structure of the Paris Agreement was due to the need to meet the particular constitutional requirements of the United States. It's undoubtedly the case under the United States Constitution that treaties that live by the president die by the president. The United States presented a number of reasons for withdrawal. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to take issue with them. But I do want to comment briefly on one of them. This is the crowning argument that the Paris Agreement impinges on America's sovereignty. As the President said in his statement, our withdrawal from the agreement represents a reassertion of America's sovereignty. Our constitution is unique amongst all nations in the world, and it is my highest obligation and greatest honor to protect it. Thus, as of today, the United States will seek all implementation, will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. That last statement raises the question how a non-binding agreement can impose obligations. But that may be an unfair remark. The basic point here, and I've said it before, is the United States exercises its sovereignty in negotiating, signing, and ratifying the Paris Agreement. That agreement was structured in important ways to accommodate the particular US constitutional situation and to meet key US negotiating demands. For example, the US position, this was under the previous president, was that all countries should have general obligations to reduce emissions, eroding the common but differentiated responsibilities principle, which had been key to the Kyoto Protocol and so damaging 
as a ground of criticism of that protocol. Another US negotiating point that was met by the Paris Agreement was that the obligations would be flexible and be revised at least, at least every five years and that financial obligations would not be legally binding. So under the Paris Agreement, although there is a framework, the content of the obligations assumed is unilateral and they're not obligations anyway. At least they're not obligations in the ordinary sense. They create what one commentator has referred to as expectations, not binding obligations. The Paris Agreement does not impose or inflict substantive obligations of any sort. It does entail certain procedural obligations in Articles 4.2 and 4.3. And there's a debate about whether these must be progressive over time. I don't want to enter into the circumstances of those debates which might arise in other contexts. It should be noted, however, that the former lead negotiator of the United States on climate change has argued that lowering the NDCs, the nationally developed determined ceilings, is permissible under the agreement. So we have a period of time, unusual though not wholly unprecedented, of substantial withdrawal from important agreements, including recent negotiated agreements on important questions. And as I said when I started, this is a cause of concern. But the international system is not crumbling. If you want to see an international system that's crumbling, go to 938 and look at the statement made by eight Western European countries following the failure of sanctions against Italy over Ethiopia. Those governments, Sweden, Norway and others, said that they would henceforth unilaterally determine what the covenant required for them because the covenant was not being implemented. It's not a very well-known instrument. It was only part of a vast range of things that, was going, that were going on at the time. To take another example, when Poland and the United Kingdom entered into uh, the treaty which triggered World War II, uh, Poland insisted that no reference be made to the obligations in the covenant because Poland wanted bits of Czechoslovakia. Now that's a system breaking down. I don't believe the present system is breaking down. I believe that it is more resilient than we might think. Nativism stalks the lands, no doubt. And it needs vigorous opposition where one is persuaded by the merits of the opposition. It may need adjustment and refinement. The international system is flexible. I don't think it's infinitely flexible. And we can do better. I think we should. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fascinating, uh, a fascinating discussion, I think, about how the, the structural tension that we always have in international relations between the central petal forces of multilateralism and cooperation are always in tension with the centrifugal forces of unilateralism, isolationism, um, and how those tensions, those political ebbs and flows are structured through the, 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 in, the legal institutions, the legal infrastructure of, of international law, and, and which is in turn both shaped by that and in turn shapes it. So, Absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much, James. And may I say particularly timely um, <laughs> series of uh, um, reflections. As you know, it's a convention at Chorley Lecture that we don't take questions after the lecture. Instead, we go for drinks, uh, which is much better, I find, uh, because then uh, not least for our speaker, who can actually answer the questions in a more convivial environment uh, and can always take the excuse of going away for get another drink. Uh, sure, the question should be a little bit taxing. But of course, that wouldn't be the case because we'll just feed James with drinks so you can interrogate him, obviously.
But please do join us for drinks. Um, they are just in the room below. Uh, just, just, follow, just follow the natives or anybody who's a frequent flyer, uh, and they will lead you in the right direction. Okay, and I look forward to seeing you uh, down there. Thank you. If we push out, please, everyone, for